hear and watch. And he went forward a little and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. And he came back and found them sleeping and said unto Peter, Simon, uh, Peter, Simon sleepest thou, could you not watch for one hour? Watch ye and pray, lest we be entered into temptation. The spirit is ready, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed and spake the same thing. And when he returned, he found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. Neither wist they had what to answer him. And he came the third time and said unto them, Sleep on now, and take ye rest. It is enough that the hour is come. Behold, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise up. Let us go, lo, that he betrayeth me is at hand. This is the beginning of denying Jesus three times. He had asked them to keep watch with him, to be there when he prayed with them. And each time that he asked them, they fell asleep. When we read the events that took place when they seized Jesus at Gethsemane, we're going to go to Matthew chapter 26, verses 50 through 56. Actually, I want to go all the way up to verse 47 first, and we'll read 47 through 56. And yet, while he spoke, lo, Judas, one of the twelve, came, and with him a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now he that betrayed him gave them a sign, saying, Whomever I shall kiss, that, is, that same is he. Hold him fast. And forthwith he came to Jesus and said, Hail, Master, and kissed him. And Jesus said unto him, Friend, wherefore art thou come? Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and took him. And behold, one of them which were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck a servant of the high priest and smote off his ear. Then Jesus said unto him, Put up again thy sword into its place, for all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? But how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled, that thus it must be? In that same hour, said Jesus to the multitudes, Are ye coming out as against the thief with swords and staves, for to take me? I sat daily with you teaching in the temple, and ye all, ye all laid no hold on me. But all of this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. And then all the disciples forsook him and fled. This is the, probably was the hardest part on Jesus when he realized that the people that he had 
traveled with, had taught, and had great many different sessions with them where he explained what it was that the Father had sent him to do and why things were being done the way that they were, suddenly just said, whoa, and dispersed from him when they came to arrest him. Now, from the minute that the started to prepare for the Passover dinner, to this point was probably about a 12-hour period of time. And for so much to happen in that short of a period of time must have been overwhelming for the disciples and the followers of Jesus to understand how all of this could have taken place. After Jesus was arrested, he was actually taken to the chief priests and the scribes and after he would not cooperate with them at all, he was turned over to Pontius Pilate. But during that time when he was with the scribes and the high priests, the prophecy that Jesus had put forth about Peter denying him three times took place. Each time there was a person in the crowd that pointed out that Peter was one of the people that was with Jesus and he denied any knowledge of Jesus at all. When he did it the third time, it was brought back to Paul's mind, or Peter's mind, I'm sorry, that he had denied him three times. And it was just as Jesus had said it would. At that point in time, you would think that Jesus would have been truly upset with them because they had denied him. They uh, definitely didn't stay with him. And yet Jesus knew, as he spoke in this, that this was all part of God's plan. I often one would wonder how Jesus must have felt since he, by the way the scriptures are written, certainly must now have known what fate was to befall him. I don't know whether the physical pain that he suffered on the cross would have been greater, but in my own heart I believe the fact that a man that was born without sin, had never sinned in his entire life, was now taking on the sins of everyone in the world. And what a crushing thing that must have been for a person who didn't know sin and all of a sudden had the sins of the world heaped on him. Can't even imagine the things that went through his head. Can't even imagine the despair that he must have felt when he saw some of the sins that he was assuming. We now go to where Jesus is taken before Pilate. And this is the scriptures that we're going to read on this is out of Mark chapter 15, verses 1 through 15.
And straight away in the morning, the chief priest held a consultation with the elders and the scribes and the whole council. And they bound Jesus and carried him away and delivered him to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, Art thou the king of the Jews? And he answered, saying unto him, Thou sayest it. And the chief priests accused him of many things, but he answered nothing. And Pilate answered him again, saying, Answerest thou nothing? Behold, how many things they witnessed against thee. But Jesus yet answered nothing, so that Pilate marveled. Now, at that feast, he released unto them one prisoner, whomsoever they desired. And there was one named Barabbas, which lay bound with them, that had made insurrection with them, who had committed murder in the insurrection. And the multitude, crying aloud, began to desire him to do as he had ever done unto them. But Pilate answered them, saying, Will ye that I release unto you the king of the Jews? For he knew that the chief priest had delivered him for envy. But the chief priest moved the people that he should rather release Babarus unto them. And Pilate answered and said unto them, What will ye then that I should do unto him? who you call the king of the Jews. And they cried out again, Crucify him. And then Pilate said unto them, Why? What evil hath he done? And they cried out, The more exceedingly, Crucify him. So Pilate, willing to contend the people, released Barabbas unto them and delivered Jesus when he had scourged him to be crucified. So even Pilate who at that point in time was the Roman governor of Jerusalem knew that Jesus had not done anything wrong. And yet the Jews wanted to crucify Jesus because, again, the scribes and the chief priests and the elders had convinced the common people that Jesus was their enemy. The chief priests were, didn't want Jesus' blood on their hands, so that's why they turned him over to Pilate. So that if anything went wrong, they were going to blame him. And Pilate turned around in one of the scriptures and had said to them, I'm doing what you want, so Jesus' blood is not on my hands because he's an innocent man. And again, all of this is taking place for one reason, and one reason alone, was to fill, fulfill the prophecies from the Old Testament. We're now going to read from Mark 15, verses 16 through 19, as they led Jesus away to be executed. And the soldiers led him away into the hall called Praetorium. And they called together the whole band. And they clothed him with purple and patted a crown of thorns and put it about his head and began to salute him. Hail, King of Jews. And they smote on him on the head with a reed, and did spit upon him, and bowing their knees worshipped him. 
And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple from him, put on his own clothes, and led him out to be crucified. I believe that today the majority of the followers of the Christian faith no longer have any real concept of what it was like to be crucified. And the reason that I say this is that there have been many movies, and many stories about the crucifixion of Christ. But in almost all of them, they never show the stark brutality that was inflicted upon Jesus. He wasn't just whipped a few times and had nails driven through his hands and his feet and raised up on the cross. But he was made to drive, to drag that cross through the streets of Jerusalem. And when you read some of the history books that go into a little bit more detail about this, the typical wooden crosses that they used to cross, uh, crucify people back in those days weighed upwards of 200 pounds. Now, he had already been beaten, he'd already been spit upon, he had already been whipped. And now they made him drag this cross through the streets of Jerusalem, 200 and some pounds. When they got to Calvary and they laid the cross down and they drove the nails or spikes through Jesus' hands and his feet. They began to inflict even more punishment on him because he not only wasn't beaten, he was stabbed, he was speared. He had salt thrown on his open wounds. He was mocked and he was put up on that cross. And on that cross, he looked out over the masses that had gathered there and said to his father, forgive them not, or forgive them for they know not what they do. And even through all of the agony, there were two thieves that were also being crucified at the same time. And the one thief spoke to the other and said, we deserve what we're getting, but here's an innocent man. And the other thief didn't particularly want to hear that. I guess he figured he had his own problem. But Jesus turned to the one that spoke of him and said, Behold, today you will be with me in my Father's house in heaven. I think that statement alone goes a long way to decry some of the things that are being spoken that in order to gain redemption, there are many hoops that you have to jump through. The simplest hoop that we have to jump through is to say, Jesus, I believe in you. I believe that you're my Lord and my Savior. It didn't say that they needed to be schooled. It didn't say anything. 
that Jesus forgave him right there on the cross while he himself was suffering in agony. Also, while he was hanging on the cross, Jesus spoke and said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's really ironic that Jesus, whose father is God, would say that. For how many times have we, in our frustration, said the same thing? God, why have you forsaken me? After he spoke that, he put his head down and he passed on. We're now going to pick up the crucifixion and his burial in Luke chapter 23, verse 23 through 56. Now this is picking up where, uh, where Pilate was passing the sentence on Jesus. And they were instant with the loud voices requiring that he might be crucified. And the voices of them and of the chief priests prevailed. Pilate gave sentence that it should be as they required, and he released unto them him for that sedation and murder, was cast into prison, whom they had desired, but he delivered Jesus to their will. And as they led him away, they laid hold upon one Simon the Cenarian coming out of the country, and on him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. And there followed him a great company of people and of women, which also bewailed and lamented him. But Jesus, turning into them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and your children. For behold, the days are coming, in which they shall say, Blessed are the barren, <coughs> the wombs that never bear, and the paps which never gave suck. Then shall they begin to say, The mountains fall on us, and the hills cover us. For if they do these things in a green tree, what shall be done in the dry? And there were also two other malefactors led with him to be put to death. And when they were come to the place, which is called Calvary, where they crucified him and the malefactors, one on the right hand and one on the other. <coughs> then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiments and cast lots. And the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them, deriding him, saying, 
He saved others. Let him save himself if he be Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar, and saying, If thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. And the scripture also was written over him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew, saying, This is the king of the Jews. And one of the malefactors which was hanging railed on him, saying, If thou be Jesus, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Does that now fear God? seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due rewards of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And it was about the sixth hour, and there was a darkness over the earth until the ninth hour. And the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit, and having said thus, gave up the ghost. They, later on, took, after he had passed, they took him down, they wrapped him in linens and in burial oil, and they sealed him in a borrowed tomb. 